All right, look with me in Matthew chapter 21. Reading in verse 1, the Bible says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say to them, The Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken and they asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to just speak to us this Palm Sunday morning. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the people that love you so much. And thank you for your presence with us. Lord, I pray that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen and amen. I have to confess to you that today is one of my favorite Sundays in the entire year. The day that we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. The joy of the Passover pilgrims on that first Palm Sunday was so contagious that 2,000 years later, it still spills over to us. Just reading the story again makes something in our heart leap for joy. After three years of miracles and teaching in the wilderness, Jesus finally comes to Jerusalem and he is finally celebrated for who he really is. No one has to keep quiet anymore. His praises can be shouted from the mountaintops. And we also have an extra advantage that the first Palm Sunday pilgrims did not have. We already know the joy of Easter Sunday that's coming just one week from today. Although the awful bloody spectacle of the cross is still ahead on Good Friday, we know that it ends in the ultimate triumph of the universe. So today we can just celebrate. Today we can just simply enjoy Jesus in all of his majestic beauty. Today is a day for spontaneous worship. Today, we let out a joyful shout. Today is a day that we open our hearts wide and we let him come riding in, bringing us his peace. Welcome, King Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Today is also a day that we can look at the scriptures again and see something new. Today is a good day to receive some fresh revelation about Jesus. Maybe you have heard it said that the Palm Sunday crowd that shouted Hosanna was the same crowd that shouted crucify him on Good Friday. While it certainly is true that human beings are fickle, especially in crowds, it is actually not true that the crowd that shouted Hosanna also shouted crucify him. In fact, Matthew goes out of his way to tell us that it was two very different crowds. On this Palm Sunday, I want us to look together at a tale of two crowds. And I want to share three observations with you quickly. A tale of two crowds. Three quick observations. First of all, I want you to notice with me this morning the preparations of our king. The preparations of our king. 
For a period of two or more weeks, Jesus made his way from Galilee in the north of Israel down to Jerusalem in the south of Israel. All four Gospels tell the story of his journey. Along the way, Jesus performed miracles. And he began to tell the disciples privately that he was going to Jerusalem to lay down his life in a violent event. And while they traveled, the crowd around them kept growing larger and larger. These were pilgrims from Galilee on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover. Their spirits were high. They were in vacation mode. They were in holiday mode. They were singing pilgrim psalms. And they were looking forward to reuniting with friends and family and feasting in Jerusalem. They were with their hero from uh, Galilee, Jesus. Exactly one week before Good Friday, Jesus healed a blind man in Jericho. From there, he walked up the backside of the Mount of Olives to the town called Bethany. Friday night and Saturday during the day, Jesus spent the Sabbath with his friends Mary and Martha and Lazarus, who had recently returned from the dead. On Saturday night, his friends threw a dinner party for him in his honor, and Mary, you remember, anointed him with a very expensive bottle of perfume. Now it's Palm Sunday morning, and Jesus and his disciples walked to the little village of Bethpage nearby, which was the outer city limits of Jerusalem. Not only was the Galilee crowd with Jesus, but also the crowd from Bethany and the surrounding region who had become his followers after he raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus sent two of his disciples back to Bethany to get a donkey and her cult. The Bible doesn't say which two he sent, but later on in the week, Jesus sent Peter and John to make arrangements for the Last Supper, so it very well could have been Peter and John. It appears that Jesus had prearranged to borrow the donkey, quite possibly from one of his disciples in Bethany. The Lord has need of these might have been a password that they had agreed upon. You know, no matter how pilgrims traveled to Jerusalem, whether they came on foot or whether they came on donkey, whether they came on camel, whether they came by train, plane, or automobile, no matter how they traveled to Jerusalem, when they hit the city limits, it was expected that they would walk the rest of the way into the city. It was tradition. Now, here's Jesus who has walked all the way from Capernaum to Jerusalem, over 100 miles on foot. But when he gets to the city limits, he makes specific arrangements to ride into the city. So I want you to get the picture. Everyone else is walking into the city, and here is Jesus riding into the city on a donkey. Jesus was riding deliberately. It was a very carefully planned prophetic act. And when the pilgrims from Galilee and his followers from Bethany saw him riding, they erupted in spontaneous praise. John says that there were Galilean pilgrims who had already gone into the city. And when they looked out and saw Jesus coming down the Mount of Olives on a donkey, they erupted in praise and they ran out to meet him. So there was a crowd in front of Jesus and there was a crowd following Jesus and they were all shouting, Hosanna. Matthew literally says it was the most crowd. In other words, it was a huge crowd of people. But here's what I want you to notice with me this morning. I want you to notice the careful planning of Jesus and the spontaneous, joyful response when people realized what was happening. Do you know that's exactly a picture of the whole story of salvation? From the very day that Adam fell into sin, God began to meticulously plan and prepare to bring us our Savior, His Son. God's plan unfolded over thousands of years of human history, especially Jewish history. And the whole plan led up to this moment, this day, this morning, when Jesus appeared over the crest of the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey. God took great 
pains to prepare for the coming and the crucifixion and the resurrection of his son. And when our eyes are finally open to that and we realize that, the response from our heart is spontaneous praise. The significance of Jesus riding on a donkey goes all the way back to the patriarch Jacob. On his deathbed in Egypt, Jacob prophesied over his 12 sons. And listen to what he prophesied over Judah. He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of nations shall be his. Listen, he will tether his donkey to a vine, and his cult to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. This is a messianic prophecy about the Savior, the Messiah, and the sign of a donkey and a cult is tied to it all the way from the time of Jacob. Fast forward a thousand years and David, the great king of Israel from the tribe of Judah, is on the throne. David was forced to flee Jerusalem. His son Absalom tried to uh, attempted a coup, tried to take over. And so David left Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives. After Absalom was killed, David returned to Jerusalem by the same route on which he fled. And at the top of the Mount of Olives, David was given two donkeys. And he rode back into the city in peace to the cheers of the people. Fast forward a few more years and Solomon, the son of David, rode to his coronation on a donkey down the Mount of Olives. First Kings chapter 1 says that the celebration was so intense that the ground shook. And over the centuries, there were layers of prophecy about this Messiah from Judah, this son of David. Zechariah prophesied that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem over the Mount of Olives, riding on a cult, just like David had. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. That means the citizens of Jerusalem. Shout, see your king comes to you lowly and riding on a donkey on a cult. The foal of a donkey. And here's what I want you to see on this Palm Sunday morning. The preparations for Jesus' ride. The preparations for that first Palm Sunday. They didn't begin Sunday morning. They didn't even begin the day before in Bethany. They began thousands of years. In fact, they began before time itself began. When we realize that God has made a meticulous plan that was executed over thousands of years of history to bring us salvation, it causes spontaneous eruptions of praise from our hearts. A tale of two crowds, three quick observations. First, notice the preparations of the king. Second, notice with me the advance of our king. Notice the advance of our king. Riding on a donkey was not only a prophetic sign of Jesus' identity, it was a sign of Jesus' intentions. Jesus did not come to Jerusalem on a white war horse to overthrow the Roman occupation. Jesus came on a symbol of peace. You know, it wasn't at all unusual for Israelite kings to ride on a donkey. It was a reassuring sign that all was well in the realm. It was a sign that the kingdom was at peace and not at war. If your king came to your town riding on a war horse, it was a sign of trouble. It meant that all the men, your husbands, your sons, were going to be drafted into the army and there was going to be bloodshed. But if your king came to your town riding on a donkey, it was a sign that there was going to be feasting and not fighting. What was unusual was that Jesus was riding on a donkey cult that was so young it had never before been ridden. It was unbroken. It must have been a, an almost comical sight to see a full-grown man sitting on top of a half-grown donkey. Unsteady, wobbling legs, taking tentative steps as it advanced down the steep slopes of the Mount of Olives. 
The cult's mother had to walk beside it to keep it steady, especially because there was a crowd waving branches and throwing garments down on the road. That would spook any animal, let alone an unbroken little cult. Prophetically speaking, Jesus' advance towards Jerusalem fulfilled scriptures to a T. But humanly speaking, it wasn't exactly an inspiring demonstration of might. It didn't seem to fit the mood of the Jewish people at all. It seemed totally out of step, out of touch. Jesus is coming and he's advancing towards Jerusalem in peace, saying all is well in the realm when all wasn't well. 2,000 years later, I find that Jesus still advances the same way in the world. Beloved, can I tell you, Jesus doesn't reveal himself in the world through the power structures or the power brokers of mankind. Jesus reveals himself in peace. He doesn't reveal himself through the mighty, through the influential. Jesus advances in the world on the unsteady, wobbling legs of his church. What is his church? In comparison to world governments and world powers, what is the church in comparison to the celebrated institutions and icons of mankind? Jesus advances in the world through a cast of insignificant characters whom he has called and equipped to be fishers of men. Jesus uses sincere salt-of-the-earth people to reach the hearts of the sophisticated. And Jesus advances towards people in peace. Jesus didn't come to tackle the problem of Roman occupation. Jesus came to tackle the problem of sin's dominion over the heart of men. Jesus didn't come to make war on Rome. Jesus came to make peace between God and man. Jesus didn't come to satisfy our longing for independence. He came to address the problem of our rebellion against the Father and to restore our covenant relationship with him. Beloved, Jesus didn't come to make us wealthy. He came to make us holy. He didn't come to make us earthly mighty. He came to make us heavenly mighty. He didn't come to assert his rule by force. He came to be received in peace. Jesus didn't come to instantly remove every unpleasant circumstance out of our lives. He came to bring us peace in the midst of the storm. There's a truth that we shouldn't overlook from the Palm Sunday story and really the whole passion story. The truth is Jesus was in complete control the whole time. Right down to the moment that on the cross, Jesus commended his spirit to the Father and breathed out his last breath, Jesus was in complete control. On Palm Sunday morning, Jesus was in complete control when he dispatched two disciples to go get a donkey and her colt and said, if anyone says anything to you, just tell them the Lord needs them. Riding down the Mount of Olives on an unbroken cult with a a mob of people around him shouting, Jesus was in complete control of that little cult and the whole scene. In spite of Rome's occupation and the chief priest's violent opposition to him, Jesus was in complete control of the temple. He was in complete control of Jerusalem. Is Jesus out of touch? No, he's not out of touch at all. In the midst of conflict and chaos, he comes riding, saying all is well in the realm. How can he do that? It's because he is the king of an unshakable kingdom. Though nature might shake and roar, though the nations might shake and roar, though Syria and Russia and the United States might threaten one another, God is our refuge and God is our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. We'll be at peace. He's the king of a kingdom that is not affected by any of the chaos of mankind. That's how even in the midst of the most tumultuous times, he can come riding as a symbol of peace, saying all is well in the realm. Jesus advances on all the hostile powers of this world in peace. And Jesus comes riding with that kind of peace into the hearts of all those who receive him. 
can't help feeling like there's someone here today and Jesus wants to come riding into your heart, bringing that kind of peace. Open your heart and let the Prince of Peace ride in. A tale of two crowds. Three quick observations. Notice the preparations of the king. Notice the advances of the king. And finally, notice with me the responses of our king. The responses to our king. Maybe you've heard it said that the same crowd that shouted Hosanna on Good Friday, also on Palm Sunday, also shouted crucify him. It's not true. There were two very different crowds. One crowd consisted of Jesus' followers from Galilee and Bethany. The 12 disciples, possibly some of their wives. The women of Galilee who were supporters of Jesus. His mother Mary, Mary Salome, the mother of James and John, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the wife of Clopas. There's a lot of Hail Marys in the, in the Passion story. A woman named Susanna and others. Thousands of Passover pilgrims from Galilee following Jesus. There were many men and women, the Gospels say, whom Jesus had healed in that crowd. Blind Bartimaeus from Jericho. Lazarus, Mary and Martha, the whole crowd of his followers from Bethany. Joanna, the wife of Herod's household manager, was in the company of Jesus' followers. John says that other Passover pilgrims from Galilee that were already in Jerusalem when they saw him coming ran out of the city worshiping the most crowd, an exceptionally large crowd. Maybe we could call them the crowd that was thrilled by Jesus. When they saw Jesus on a, on a donkey cult, they erupted in spontaneous praise. They took off their overcoats and they laid them down on the road to make a red carpet welcome for Jesus. You know, the overcoats for traveling were valuable. They were expensive. You could actually use your overcoat. You could put it up as collateral for a personal loan. They were an asset. And yet when the people saw Jesus coming, when they felt his presence, they took off those assets and they laid them down to welcome him. They began to spontaneously shout the words of one of the pilgrim psalms, Psalm 118, that they had been singing on the walk to Jerusalem. Hosanna literally means save us. It's actually a prayer request. It's actually a petition. It's a cry for help. Save us, God. But it became a declaration of praise and of faith. We're saved now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The one who comes in the name of the Lord is the king of Israel leading the Passover procession. In David's time, it was David. In Solomon's time, it was David. But now, it's Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah. That's one crowd. The other crowd consisted of the residents of Jerusalem who either didn't know Jesus or who didn't like him if they did. The chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, Annas, the high priest emeritus, Caiaphas, his son-in-law, the current high priest, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the establishment priests in Jerusalem who lived sumptuously, Herod and the Roman regime, sophisticated Jerusalem society. Maybe we could call this crowd the crowd that was threatened by Jesus. Matthew says that when this crowd saw the other crowd worshiping Jesus, they were deeply shaken. They asked, who is this? You know, the scene is reminiscent of Matthew chapter 2 when the Magi arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the one who's born the king of the Jews? Matthew said, then the whole city was alarmed. The whole city was shaken. And once again, here as Jesus is approaching, the city is shaken. You know, the word there is the word seismic. It's the same Greek word that we use to get seismic activity. So what Matthew is saying is that that crowd, they were quaking in their boots at the sight of Jesus coming towards them. Seismic describes the earthquake that split the 
curtain of the temple in two at the moment that Jesus cried out, it is finished. Seismic describes the earthquake exactly one week later on Easter Sunday when the stone was rolled away and Jesus came out of the tomb and graves all over Jerusalem were broken open and the bodies of righteous people were raised to life again. The Roman guards fainted like dead men out of fear. They were shaken. And so observe on Palm Sunday a tale of two crowds. It was the best of times for those who were thrilled by Jesus. And it was the worst of times for those who were threatened by him. And Palm Sunday is the same today. It is still a tale of two crowds. Some who are thrilled by Jesus and others who are threatened by him. Listen to a tale of two crowds. Those who are thrilled by Jesus are pilgrims in this world. We're on a spiritual journey. This isn't our home. We're headed to God's permanent dwelling place, his temple in the heavenly realms. Those who are threatened by Jesus are firmly planted in this world. They love the things of this world and they pursue them rather than God's presence. Those who are thrilled with Jesus look forward in hope to a coming age, the age of Messiah's kingdom. Those who are threatened by Jesus are fixated on the present. The proclamations of the thrilled still threaten the establishment to this day. Isn't it amazing all over the world, even on Palm Sunday morning, that the powers that be are so threatened by the followers of Jesus. Open my eyes this morning and the first thing I read was that earlier today, 30 Christians were killed in Egypt and over another 80 were wounded as bombs went off in their churches as they were celebrating Palm Sunday. Why is it that those who are so firmly planted in the world are so threatened by the presence of a few Christian pilgrims among them? Why are the sophisticated so threatened by simple people of faith? Those who are thrilled with Jesus receive him as their king. They spontaneously submit to him in childlike trust, taking off your coat and laying it down on the road for the king to ride over it was a sign of submission. You're receiving his authority. You're submitting, you're accepting his authority. Those who are thrilled by Jesus receive his reign of peace. They see him as a different kind of leader. They embrace his upside down kingdom and they welcome the personal changes he brings. Those who are threatened by Jesus see him as delusional and a deceiver. They refuse his leadership. They reject his offer of peace and prefer instead to play the world's power games. Those who are thrilled by Jesus proclaim his identity. Those who are threatened by him question his identity. The residents of Jerusalem said, who is this? In other words, who does he think he is riding into Jerusalem like that? The pilgrims from Galilee answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. This is the ruler that Jude, that Jacob foretold. This is the prophet that Moses predicted. This is the son of David that Nathan foresaw. This is the branch, the Nazarene that Isaiah anticipated. This is the king on a cult that Zechariah prophesied. Those who are thrilled with Jesus recognize the signs of his coming because they're full of the word of God. Beloved, listen to me. If you're full of the word of God, then you'll look at today's headlines and you'll look at what's playing out on the world stage and you'll realize that there are signs of his coming all around us. Syria, Russia, Iraq, Iran. You'll see how events are lining up on the world stage. If you're full of the world word, you'll, you'll see signs of his coming. You see, those who were thrilled with Jesus, they were full of the word. So they recognized the sign of him riding on the cult. They had read the word. They studied the word. They meditated the word. They cherished the word, repeating it over and over again until it was hidden in their hearts. Those who are thrilled by Jesus receive him just as he has revealed himself. 
those who are threatened by Jesus are looking for a savior of their own making, a savior of their own imagination who will fulfill all their longings and all their desires and do their bidding. Those who are thrilled by Jesus erupt when his presence draws near. The word that's in them pours out praises mingled with prayer requests and professions of faith pour out. A victory shout arises from their lips. They honor him with joyful offerings, laying down their assets. They create a red carpet for his presence to travel on. Those who are threatened by Jesus hold tightly to what they have, their possessions, their positions, their prestige. Those, listen to this one, those who are thrilled by Jesus, old traditions take on spontaneous new joy and new life for them when his presence draws near. Songs people have sung for centuries become new all over again. Acts of worship that people have performed for centuries become new all over again. Scriptures that people have cherished in their hearts become new all over again. You know, the Lord spoke to me through this about phase two and about what we're going to do in the new building. I have to tell you, we got to finish the building and we're working on that. But, but my heart, even beyond the construction, my heart is just so burning. God, what are we going to do in phase two? And, and as I was just reflecting on these scriptures, the Holy Spirit spoke to me a couple of days ago about our new building. And he said, as we pray and as we praise and as we lay down our assets, as we create a red carpet to welcome his presence, when he comes in phase two, old traditions are going to become alive again for millennials. Old traditions are going to come alive again for our students. Old traditions are going to come alive again for our young people, for our children. Those who are thrilled by Jesus are passionate for his house. Those who are threatened by him are indifferent to his house. Those who are thrilled by Jesus are eager to enthrone him. Those who are threatened by him want to eliminate him. Those who are thrilled by Jesus shout Hosanna on Palm Sunday. Those who are threatened by him shout crucify him on Good Friday. Beloved, listen to me. Palm Sunday is not a story about a crowd that turned fickle on Friday. It is a tale of two crowds. The real story is not that those who shouted Hosanna later shouted crucify him. The real story is that many who did shout crucify him on Friday soon enough would confess he is risen and he is Lord. The real story is that many who were once threatened by him would soon enough join the company of those who are thrilled by him. And here's the best part. They still had to wait and see what would happen on Easter Sunday morning, but we, we already know. We don't have to wait another week to believe on Jesus. We don't have to wait another week to receive him. We can do it today on Palm Sunday. A tale of two crowds. Observe with me the preparations of our King, the advance of our King, and the response to our King. And let your heart be thrilled by Jesus on Palm Sunday. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place today?